good to have you home. And uh, in the audience, uh, welcome very much to Conversation. A distinct pleasure, uh, professionally and at all other levels, for me to welcome to the program Reed Stowe, in my book, A True American Hero, whose uh, exploits in this world ought to be celebrated much further than they have been up to now. You may be aware of him from the newspaper reports. He recently completed a, a voyage on the oceans of the world, the Mars Sea Odyssey it was called, uh, out of sight of land and away from resupply of any kind from the land on his schooner, the Anne, and did that for 1,152 days, setting a world record. And he came back just recently, a couple months ago, and he's here to talk about his life story and other matters. And Reed, welcome so much to Conversations. Welcome back to New York. Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, it's so good. it's my great good pleasure. Reed, we're going to be talking, and we're going to be getting some shots of you, as it were. But maybe you would share your own background. There are people who may not be aware, but maybe you could share your background a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to begin with the catamaran or the building of the Anne, but some of your background, and then we'll talk about the, this voyage that you've just completed in some detail and share it with the audience. But you share your own background, if you would, please. Uh, well, you're speaking of my sailing background. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which, uh, so our family mm -hmm. built a cottage in North Carolina on the inland waterway. Uh -huh. That was my granddad. Right. And his uh, children mm -hmm. and their husbands and wives mm -hmm. Uh, had children, and they all came there every summer and during vacations. And as a child, I grew up in that uh, environment, uh, watching my dad and granddad build the house and build and repair boats mm -hmm. by the waterfront. And so I learned to love the ocean and love the water, and I learned boat building as a child. As a child, a 10-year-old. Well, just or helping yeah. my dad. Yeah, yeah I was right. always around right. it. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. so... Um, as a teenager, I was surfing in Hawaii All right. and mm -hmm. met another teenager who had a sailboat mm -hmm. and was going to sail off into the South Pacific. I mm -hmm. had never been sailing before, right. but I thought that sounded like a great adventure. It was. So I sailed off with him into the South Pacific. What kind of a boat did he have? He uh, was allowed to spend his college money and buy a sailboat and uh, go on a world adventure. Uh -huh. This was 1971, uh -huh. and he, he bought a nice wooden sloop 35 feet long uh -huh. um, and uh, and he took courses at the uh, with the Coast Guard uh -huh. uh, auxiliary yeah. to learn navigation because right, back right. then we had to navigate with sextants uh -huh. in the traditional way uh -huh. and we sailed off and sailed in the South Pacific for a year. That was a high adventure, right? So it, for teenagers at that time yeah. it was a great adventure. Right. We had right. a great time, everything uh -huh. went good and uh -huh. from then on I was you sold were, on you sailing, hooked, yeah, and I've been sailing. really sailing all my life. It's true, you really have, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. And you were—you would have been a, a middle teenager then at that time, or? Well, I was nineteen. Nineteen. Okay, and, nineteen. Uh, uh huh. And we sailed through the South Pacific for a year. Uh, for a year. When we were uh, in the South Pacific, I met uh, sailors who were friends with. The first man to sail around the world without stopping. Mm -hmm. He was a Frenchman, Bernard Montessier. Mm -hmm. And my friends who were his friends, mm -hmm. I met them when they sailed away from him when he was in Tahiti. Uh -huh. And I met them in Fiji. I see. Uh -huh. And uh, then we all sailed down to New Zealand. Uh -huh. And it was there in New Zealand that I hung out with, with some Great world sailors, Mar who, mariners, yeah. mariners, yeah. yeah, and adventurers, adventurers, because yeah. they were because you're an adventurer, you're pushing the limit. We right? sail small boats, yes, uh, that we build mm -hmm. ourselves uh -huh. to all places in the world Wonderful. as we choose. Wonderful, entrepreneurial, all kinds of things are encompassed in that. But you're down in New Zealand, and then didn't you build a catamaran or something back in North Carolina, or is that well, getting? Well, when I was curve? in New Zealand, I had an opportunity to actually go on a boat that was the first Greenpeace mission to protest atom bombs in, okay, good. in, uh, in the French Polynesia. Right. And I said, no, I'm not a protester. 
uh, and I could have gotten on a party boat with a bunch of great yeah, guys. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I could have gotten on a big racing boat, mm. and I could have gotten on Errol Flynn's old boat with no a, some rich people and sailed in luxury. That's right. He hung out in New Guinea. Didn't and he, yeah. uh, he yeah. had a beautiful sailboat that he, he sailed. Did he? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I turned all that down because I said, no, I have a spiritual voyage that I'm going to go on. You've been into that. Tantra and that kind well, of stuff is so very important to you in yoga. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was introduced to yoga, and uh -huh. I was doing yoga. Mm -hmm. And there in the South Pacific, um, I was introduced to um, Carl Jung, and I read Carl Jung's books, and I read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. You, and yeah, that I, was what well, led yeah. me to uh, Eastern mysticism, Okay. and yeah. especially Tantra. Uh -huh. And I was 20 years old when I built my first boat. I went back home to North Carolina, and I said, Granddad, can I live in the family beach house, and yeah. will you let me build a boat uh -huh. there? And you went to me. your granddad rather went than your daddy. Went to my granddad. Because your daddy probably would have said no. Well, Go to he school. might have. Dad, yeah. he could he, have. Great guy. I met him. I met yeah. him. Great well, Dad, guy. And your Dad mother has always been very supportive. Yeah, right. But he couldn't say yes. It was really granddad who was in charge yeah. of the family beach house. It's often easy to go to granddad. Well, you know, granddad was more mellow to me mm -hmm. than he was to his son, who's yeah, my uncle. Right, right. Who, uh, who became a world sailor himself, uh -huh, built uh -huh. his own boat and sailed uh -huh. around the world. All right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but when he was a young man, granddad made him go to college and made him become right. an engineer like him. Right, right. But when I was a young man and I went to granddad, he had mellowed out. He yeah. said, okay, I'll help you do That's what you right. want to do. That's right. The granddad's like to be mellowed so out. Follow your dream, young man. Follow yeah, your he, dream. That kind of thing. He helped me right. out. Yeah, so that, yeah. that was going back to North Carolina. Because, and yeah. And then mm -hmm. building that boat. Mm -hmm. um, you built I, that yourself. Now you're talking about a catamaran. Catamaran. Right, okay, yeah. But you know, my father built a catamaran when I was 12 years old. Okay. A plywood and fiberglass huh? catamaran. Right, okay. So I saw so that as a young young child. You bought one that was seaworthy? Uh, well, his boat wasn't. I know, but his you boat built, was a, yeah. Well, my boat was a boat meant to sail on the ocean, so yeah. it was a seaworthy Big boat. Big difference, right? Well, seaworthy boats have to have certain qualities, I but think, yeah. catamarans are a little bit dangerous. Yeah. Especially small catamarans are yeah. dangerous because... Yeah. They can flip over. Yeah. If they flip over, there's really no way to get them back up again. And if I'm not mistaken, you were about 19 or 20 or something like that, and you sailed across the mighty North Atlantic Ocean in that catamaran with no life preserver or anything like that? Is that <laughs> correct? You would have to be young and adventurous to do such a silly uh, thing. Yeah. 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 Well, we figured that we had heard about a guy that had sailed across the North Atlantic in a boat named Tinkerbell. Uh -huh. It was 12 feet long. Uh -huh. And we said, wow. well, if he can do it, we can do it. And uh, we actually picked the right season. Mm -hmm. We left in July. You have to pick So it's the, oh, the yeah. best weather possible. Okay. So it was mostly light weather. Mm -hmm. It was all actually mostly beautiful weather going across the you North Atlantic. You want to avoid those it storms got a little cold. in the North Atlantic. So we yeah. went across at the best time. We went yeah. with the wind and we yeah. went with the current. We had no motor, no radio, no electronics, no electricity. No life No boat? life raft. No life raft. No. Were you a good swimmer? Well, of course, uh, I was a good swimmer. But I mean, and did you have any way of communicating to the no broader communications. world? No communications. No. Now that would be a, what no, many no, people I never would had say. Communications that was on on um, all of my ocean voyages. But you weren't worried at all about being uh, overcast or, or cast over the side, or you know, the boat tipping or anything. You weren't thinking that way because you were young well, and we strong. Well, we sailed very cautiously and cautious. very carefully, and okay. you have to be aware because if a strong wind comes, yeah. you want to get your sails down, and then you can ride it out. But you leave your sails up, and the wind hits the boat; it could turn it over. Yeah. And the same with uh, with my big schooner. It's a big schooner. Well, we've got to talk about well, that, well, yeah. Yeah, so you have to be watching the weather very closely. Right, right. And, yeah. and time the weather with the places that you go mm -hmm. so that you're sailing in the best seasons and so that you're sailing with the wind and the current. Well, you've had and that was why we really had a very successful voyage. On the catamaran. catamaran. And did yeah. you, what did you do coming back? Did you sail back, or did you take an airplane back, or what? Well, no, I, I sailed to four con well, I sailed to four continents <laughs> in that little catamaran. Well, I, and were you on your own, or another fellow? With I you? sailed. Another guy. With I you. had a. You see, I had one of my friends who I met in the South Pacific, uh -huh. who was really a teacher to me. I was 19. He was 24. Oh. He was sailing a 19-foot plywood boat by himself, uh -huh. and he was the one who gave me Carl Jung and the mm. Tibetan Buddha, oh, I see. Uh, Book right. of the Did, and who turned me on to that, mm -hmm. and we became very good friends. I lived with him on his boat. Mm -hmm. And then when I went back to the U.S., mm -hmm. 
he later sailed his boat up to Hawaii and sold it. He was Dutch. He was on his way back to Holland. Mm -hmm. He came to North Carolina and he says, why don't we sail your little catamaran to Holland? Mm. And I said, well, that sounds great. The timing was perfect. <laughs> I finished building the boat. Yeah. He was there. He said, let's go. I wouldn't have attempted to cross the Atlantic without my older friend. Yeah who yeah. was the one who taught me. Right. Okay. So he, yeah, that, that was a very important yeah. moment in yeah. my life that yeah. he arrived like that yeah. by surprise and said, let's go. Well, you were Because that was a boost in my, a real boost in my whole sailing adventure life. You were, you were in touch with synchronicity of Mr. Jung and so forth. I mean, that was a synchronous that. thing that happened and you live by that and it's very important yeah. to you. You live, you're very spiritual in your thing and you're also very artistic. You're a great painter if I may say so, and sculptor. You got sculpting on the boat, but maybe we should get to the boat because you came back to North Carolina and you built with your own hands from timbers right out of the forest or something like that, well, we a 70 foot gaff rig schooner that you named Anne and it was seaworthy and that was a major event, I guess it took place on the shores of North Carolina. That's right. Okay. Okay. That was quite a feat. Uh, uh, while I was sailing the, cat, the catamaran, mm. I had the concept of building a boat that could go anywhere in the world and survive for a long time. You had that in your mind? That's From what the, I built this boat for. That you had it in the mind? That was what I had as a concept uh -huh. when I had the little catamaran. Why do you have that concept, do you think? I mean, Because I mean? loved being on the sea. You like being because on the sea. Because when I sailed, uh -huh. I, I just loved it so much. It mm -hmm. was always beautiful. I always had magical, illuminating experiences. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really care so much about where I I'm was going. going. You liked what the I sea. liked was being on the sea. Right. And I uh, thought about what I could do to be able to sail on the sea for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that was long how the concept was, for this schooner came was, about. Was, it, was the concept a long time or was it in tough waters? Because I know you I, sailed well, to Antarctica yeah. or something right. at a young age and everything. Well, when end. I built the schooner, mm -hmm. I said the boat has to be able to go anywhere in the world, uh -huh. especially to Antarctica. Wow. So then I got all the Antarctic books that I could and read the history of Antarctica. And then I looked at all the boats and what was the seaworthy type of boat mm -hmm. and how were they sailed and mm -hmm. so forth. And also how were they constructed yes. to be seaworthy under the, worst, and the most harrowing or difficult situation in terms of weather and that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you did that and you built it? And the, yeah, okay. And you launched it there in North Carolina? That's right. When did you launch the boat? The 1978. Was that in a magic day? Of 1978. Do you still remember that day vividly? When you, did, you re, did you do it like coming out of Newport News or something, the boat coming down a ramp or something into the ocean? Or how did it get into well, the ocean off the shore? Where we it was built, built? A, a big ramp, ramp and a big railway. It was part of the pale, yeah, the pattern, yeah. And, the, and a cradle to hold the boat uh -huh. to slide down the ramp. Right. We thought it was going to slide down the ramp, <laughs> but it ended up taking us a week to inch it down to the water and get it into the water. Oh, it did. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like hitting it with a bottle of champagne. Well, we hit it with a bottle of champagne, <laughs> and then it went uh, <laughs> Two <inches>. 15 feet <laughs> and stopped, and that was it. So oh, it, do you have we any of worked it down the ramp. Reed, do you have any of that on, uh, on tape? Do you, oh, have yeah, any, do. you do have video we tape or that film? We on, on film. Maybe 8 millimeter or something back in I those just, days. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you that. want to do that. Because your story is one that just will sing in the history of the United States of America because it's very unique and very adventuresome and it's a great story. So it finally it got on the sea and she floated well and everything and you've been living on that uh, more or less ever since. I guess, what, it must be 32, 33 years. Wow. And you called it Anne after your mother. That's correct. That was very sweet. You called the catamaran Tantra, I think, because the you catamaran were so... catamaran was named Tantra. And it's true to say you are an artist. You're a good painter. I've been and an a artist good... all my life. Yeah. I've always loved painting. Right. And I always felt that my paintings were magical. Okay. That's good. You like the idea of magic. You, you, well, that just means, that, implies gotta... that they do something that you can explain with a logical mind. Something right. wonderful. Okay, yeah, there's something magical about that. That's really yeah. good. It's like an artistic temperament or an artistic yeah. and right. spiritual uh, sense of your own being and universe and so forth, rather than just be, you could have been an accountant. Well, or you could have know, gotten a job uh, selling nails at the corner hardware store. I don't know about you that. You know, in not, order to pay possibly. the rent. You know, I got on my you know neighbor's roof yeah. and I said, 
I, let's let's move it up a little here and down a little bit yeah, here. I yeah. looked from the neighbor's roof at the at the shape of the boat and yeah. said, down a little here, yeah. up a little here. Yeah, yeah. And my dad said, well, Reed, you're not making art here. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> I am too. This yeah. is a this is a work of art and yeah, love. Yeah, it's a right. work of yeah. art and love. And you've been sailing on that thing for all that time. You sailed all over the world. You see, you 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 you've been on the Anne for quite a while now, right? Right. And, and where 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 did it take you? You were still into this idea of the long voyage. You had that in your eye from when you were very young, even that long voyage, not right. just one into harrowing circumstance or something, but a long voyage. To be able to handle because what Because you ocean. happen to have set the world's record, as we just said at the outset, and so we want to get to that. But you did some sailing on the Ant quite a bit. And oh, yeah. share a little of that. You were out in the West. You did go to Antarctica. Yes. That's something to sail into the Antarctic waters on a, on a ship like that, a boat yeah. like that. You don't call it a ship, it's a boat. Yeah, it's a yeah. boat. I like to call it a schooner. A schooner, because right. a schooner is a special type of boat. Is it really? What's it? What's the? What? Where does it fit in? They have trawlers. Well, I'll tell you, they have schooners. You know, they have a schooner is a sailing rig, and the type of boat that I had was built and sailed without motors. Uh huh. Uh, you have a motor on. it. I have a motor. Okay. Okay. Go yeah. on. Yeah. But mm. the type of that type of boat was built, uh, say around 1800. Eight? Schooners started to come into design to be sailed. Help me out. I used to think the flying cloud. There well, were, those there, are those ships. Were they ships have more that mass. Were, they, 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 and they, more that sails. wouldn't be a schooner. That no. would be a what? A schooner has two masts. Okay. With the biggest mast in the back of the boat. Okay. Okay. And the the Americans really built the first. Uh, real good schooners Did around really? 1800. Really, okay. they became famous for that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, according to the uh, history of of American sailboats, yes. the schooner is the most important boat. Really, there were the, some clipper ships were great. Clipper, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, of. Some the clipper flying ships cloud were great, was a famous and one. Those yeah. were wonderful boats. Yeah, but there were hundreds and hundreds of schooners built on the East Coast and the West Coast uh -huh. since the time of the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. and those boats were the boats that hauled all the cargo up and down the coasts mm -hmm. and were involved in many more historical events. It was a work that horse. became, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and the, also the, the American fishing schooner. Okay, fishing uh, also. Well, they used them for, for fishing yeah, right, all, right. The, all the time. So this type of boat became the most handy a boat that was versatile that could do the most sailing and did the most sailing mm -hmm. and the the uh, the gaff rig schooner mm -hmm. uh, is an old-fashioned type of boat mm -hmm. but I wanted to build a boat like that because I could chop down my own trees for the masts and the booms and the spars <laughs> and put Wonder. my own rigging cable right. on and you did you went and in I the could forest. do it all by hand you did it on North Carolina yeah, and found right. your right tree and fashioned it all lovingly mm -hmm. and correctly and artfully and did it, and congratulations on having and achieved that. A boat that. like that is much cheaper to build. It is cheaper oh, than uh, well, you know, a modern um, boat uh, has has a, an aluminum mast, or yeah. even now carbon fiber and yeah, stainless yeah. rigging cables right, and all right. kinds of expensive fittings. Uh -huh. But with with this boat, we built all of the masts and spars, and we wrapped the rigging cable around the mast mm -hmm. and brought it down and turned it up and put turnbuckles on. Mm. It's a much easier, less technical boat to build. Also a tip of the hat to history, in a sense, and a historical tradition, well, a rich me, historical tradition. Well, it was the most tradition. romantic Romantic. You see, you've got boat. a bit of the romantic. The most you're beautiful not... romantic type of boat. But you do have to also have a very practical side when you're sailing on the waters of the world because there's a great deal of uh, activity that takes place in terms of maintenance, the sails. You have to say it. You have to yeah. repair everything. Well, the practical everything. thing is it's... this boat was proven. Mm -hmm. for, its history was proven for 200 years before I decided I was going to build a boat like was that, that. Was that was that design around the world? Did it spread around the world from America? Was yes, that, oh, it really? did. Okay, well, that was a gift of America very, to the world. Very and much it was so. used in the sailing era. And uh, it was very good. Congratulations on having put it together. You probably have a close um, emotional connection with the Anne. Well, yes, very much so. I would much think so. so. I would think so. Yeah. yeah, right. And you sailed all around. Now, why don't we try to bring it up? Because you've just set this record. And you had it in mind, and uh, after sailing, you had many adventures, a good, great deal we could talk about and so forth, good connection with the family and all that sort of thing. But then you came to New York some time ago. Maybe you could talk how you came to be in the New York area, and then we could get down to the Mars Sea Odyssey and the actual <coughs> event that uh, uh -huh. has just been all over the news recently for those that picked up on it. Well, the, the reason I came to New York mm -hmm. is because I'm an artist. You are. And I wanted You're to be good involved artist, yeah. in the art scene uh -huh. and be around the most interesting art 
uh, that was be happening in the world. And artists. And artists. Yeah, it's a happening the, town. Yeah. So that was why yeah. I wanted to come to New York, because yeah. I'm an artist. It's a draw to artists from all over the world, in a way. There's yeah. artists it's here like from Paris all over the world. In the 20s. So yeah, like, yeah. Uh, mm. much more so now in America for yeah. the last uh, 50, 60 years, 70 Seems that years. Way. It's yeah. been the yeah. most in New York. Yeah, right. Uh, so York's I wanted a great to come town. to New York. Yeah. Uh, because I'm an artist. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so when I came here with the schooner, yeah. I was hoping to be um, to get sponsorship yeah, for the I would voyage think so. yeah. by coming to the place where that was the media capital of the world. Mm -hmm. I did get a lot of media stories because mm -hmm. the story is interesting, yeah, but inherently. I couldn't turn that into sponsorship. Okay, and now. I never could understand why because I'd get a great story in the New York Times and another one in New Yorker magazine and I, I'd get the stories now, and I'd make Xeroxes of them and put them with my proposal right, and right. approach right. All, uh, all kinds of people and uh -huh. corporations. Right. And I never it never worked for It'd me. It'd be worth talking about that because you're going to be uh, in the annals of American history one of America's heroes and you're, you're destined for that whether you like it or not I believe by what you've done but you had the idea you got the idea when you're taking a proposal w w did you have the idea the see how did you get the idea of the Mars Sea Odyssey idea the thousand yeah. days how did that and did that give you a lodestar like or the Polaris or something that would set the tone of what it is you were going to set out for yourself in terms of a specific project that could be presented to people who would be interested in a sailing venture that you were proposing. Right. To me, the the uh, once I had the concept of doing the longest sea voyage in history, but okay. you see, well, for 20 years before that, I still was thinking that I wanted to build and prepare a boat to go anywhere in the world and do anything and stay out there for a long time. You had that from when you were a kid. Well, I had that or from when, when I was young. young. Yeah, right. I say, when I you that built the end, you had that boat. in mind. I had yeah. that before I okay. built the boat. Okay. I okay. built the boat for that purpose. Uh -huh. That's what they celebrate at places like the Explorers Club. So, Not only geographical exploration, but also testing human endurance under difficult situations. And you were set to do that or set that. Right. So okay. when, when I uh, got the idea to do the Thousand Day Sea Voyage, it had a lot of levels to it that, um, that I was looking at. Uh, besides the longest uh, voyage in history, I wanted it to be a spiritual voyage that would be something that would cause me to grow and something that I could share with humanity. Yeah, that's your spiritual Well, so you're asking your about the concept romantic. of... Yeah how I tied it into the space program. One thing could I ask, what had been the longest, what had been the record? There was a Frenchman or something that set a record? Okay, Maybe set that pattern that you right. were in a sense going so to So I spoke of when I was sailing in the South Pacific right. and, the, uh, and the friends I had were friends with the first man to sail around the world without stopping. That he did that a year or two before I was in the South Pacific okay. and he was in the South Pacific. Right, and you met him. So his friends, I, I later met uh, yeah. Bernard Montessier in California, right, first okay. man to sail around the world without stopping. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and his friends feat. influenced me. So in 1986, mm -hmm. when I was preparing to go to Antarctica, I was in New Zealand again, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, um, what can I do next? And I said, I'll do the longest sea voyage in history. And then I said, well, how long should it be? I knew that he well, had gone 300 okay. days, something 300, like that. that. On that one voyage, on right? That voyage. And that had been a record. And okay. that was the record for the longest. Had there been a record for there the longest another... time at sea without resupply such as you were going to set out for yourself? Okay, well, at that time, mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember how many days he did, but there was another person, an Englishman, mm -hmm. uh, Sir Robin Knox Johnson, mm -hmm. who is still alive, who mm -hmm. was also sailed around the world without stopping, yeah. but he went back to England and received the award for that from the English. And they've been promoting him as the first to sail around the world without stopping. Oh, and there's it a was somewhere there. around 300 days. In, in both cases. I don't cases. remember in both what, cases, what right? it was. Uh -huh, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Without stopping. Right. Without resupply. And in both cases, no resupply. No resupply okay, was the right. rule. Uh -huh. Rules for for that uh, setting that kind of a pattern. Setting yeah. the record for the longest voyage. Right. Major thing. Yeah. Then after that, uh, John Sanders from Australia went. 420 days. Okay. Okay, that he, set the record further. That set the record further. Uh -huh. John Sanders went back and went 658 days. Same fellow. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. 
Now, again, as far no as we resupply. Know, no American's gone over 300 days. Okay, no, no American, American sailor has okay. been at sea over 300 days. Even with all that rich mariner I don't know, tradition, probably we have. less than that. Uh huh. Okay. So right. we don't we don't know. No, right. In all right. of my sailing, whenever I was talking, mm. people said, "Oh, the whalers." But then you read the book of the whalers, and mm. you know that that uh, they had a lot of problems with food and health, sure. and that they were stopping everywhere and picking up supplies, right. even if they sure. were gone for a long time. Yeah, I don't think they were and very so the, interested in And the in cargo anything. boats, the sailboats were always in a hurry to go from one place to the next. Right. They were they driven had, by finances. Yeah, and they, so had to get the, they had to get the catch back to have it so it didn't rot, for one thing, because they, they had ice considerations. Right. And all. So it they, was did, a, they weren't doing long without long voyages without resupply. Right, So right. That, that started to come about in the, in the 60s. And they were probably pretty, rom they were probably pretty practically minded, those fishermen and so forth. They were practically minded. They had a catch to get and everything. They probably weren't well, as romantic. Well, none of them were out for that long. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but I understand. There, that was just another, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. You understand what I'm saying. You were on a, you were, you have a romantic, that's wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, a, a cut to your jib, as they say. Yeah. When I conceived of the, Voyage. I knew that, uh, the, that the guys ahead of me had done 300 and something days. Right. Uh -huh. And so I decided I'll go a thousand days. That number just came to me out of the blue. It did. And uh, I said, that's moment, what I'll do. All of a moment? Well, did it, do you remember where you were? Were you I on the Stern Auckland, Castle or yeah, something? No, or I, was in, I remember exactly. Yeah. I was in Auckland, we, New Zealand. Okay. And I said, 300 and something. Yeah. Added twice, yeah, and I went to put it in my head. Yeah, you know, yeah. with, uh, and in, and the number started sp spinning like a slot machine. Really, yeah. and they stopped on one and three zeros. Well, it was a very down. visual thing. Yeah, really. Yeah, really? that's what I saw. We got to get that in the movie. You, so, you understand, you're going to become the subject of uh, many, many movie <laughs> pictures that are going to celebrate your life story. But go ahead, yeah. So that's yeah. how I came that's up a with, great the, with the one thousand. That days. was in that was in New Zealand. Yes. Were you on a mountaintop? Do you remember no, where you were? You on, on a headland in the harbor. I'm trying to think I'm of a cinematographic. Where are we going to have you play? I'm always on my boat. Oh, okay. You so were I was on my boat. boat. In we just got to get the graphics. New Zealand, right. which yeah. is a wonderful city. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. So that was how I conceived of the 1,000. Made now, today. Do you have a date for that? Do you have a date for that? Do you have a date? The thousand days when in New Zealand? Do you have a date in a diary? Do you keep a diary? Do you keep a journal? Well, I don't keep an exact journal when I'm sailing. That's a major I wasn't writing then, but I would say it was in December of a, a, uh, 1986, December when I conceived 86. of the Thousand Day Sea Voyage. In December of 86, I was in New Zealand. Right. Out of the hicks, yeah. Okay, now, yeah. Uh, uh, many years before that, mm. on my catamaran, mm. I wrote about how I'm a spaceman, mm -hmm. and I'm equipped to live uh, on the sea for longer than the seabirds. Oh, wow. Because they have to Even keep coming albatross. back to shore, but I can go further than they can. Even the albatross. So I saw myself as a, as a spaceman. Is it the albatross that goes forever across the ocean? They, they're, they're the ones they're just, that do the long flights yeah, and live at sea for a long time. Huh? Yeah. Isn't it magnificent? And they're mainly in the, in the southern latitudes. There's a lot of magnificent life forms to see on There's, the ocean. Right. Well, there is, but yeah. you know, the ocean has less variety than the land. Okay. There's okay. not a big variety out there. Okay. Well, things. we'll get to that. Well, the trouble is, you're too yeah. damned interesting, Reed. You ought to sc scale down a little bit. You wanted to know how I uh, yeah, came we're going to talk how the, the thousand day right. concept. Right. 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 Uh, and so I had uh, I had the idea that I was a spaceman. Yeah. Well, when, after I did the Antarctic expedition, yeah. I heard about the Mars program right. and that it was going to take about a thousand days uh -huh. to go to Mars land and spend time on Mars doing the work that they do uh -huh. and fly back. And I it said, was a round trip to Mars. A round trip. Okay. And living at Mars was yeah. going to take a thousand days. Right. So I said, well, that's the same as me. Right. And then I started to read. You had the thousand days in your head already. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. I started to read yeah. the space psychology. Yeah. Right. And they were saying, we suppose it'll be like this, mm. and we suppose it'll be like that. Mm -hmm. And I put my experience of living on a boat at sea for long periods of time to going to Mars. And my experience uh, on uh, in Antarctica yeah. with a, a group of people isolated in a dangerous, high performance environment for an right. extended period of time. Yeah. Extending human and, endurance. Uh, um, and yeah. I said, what a lot of things they're supposing are things that I know by fact. From living with this crew of people in these sort of conditions, mm -hmm. certain people are going to act up. They're going to act in certain ways. Yeah. This is what's going to happen with group dynamics. Uh -huh. And here's how some person who may act up and fade out for a while, here's mm -hmm. how you have to try to get them back into the group and the whole thing of human psychology. A huge That issue. was what I was interested right, in. Right, right. And that's right. why I promoted the voyage as a 
Mars, uh, Mars Analogous Expedition. Uh -huh. And I said, seafarers of today provide a role model for spacefarers of tomorrow. Wonderful Those idea. Those spacefarers who are going to go into space for an extended period of time. Absolutely. You can look at seafarers who spend mm. a lot of time at sea and gain psychological knowledge. Absolutely. To apply that to sending humans into space. Right. That's what one aspect mm -hmm. of what the uh, thousand day voyage, I still call it the thousand day voyage. Yeah, sure, why even not? Though I went yeah, more your than sight. That. But that's only one aspect of the voyage mm -hmm. that I was working on mm -hmm. and wanting to share. But that's a great idea. That's something you could pitch. Because you said you were looking for some support for the, for the, from yeah. the big shots, the big media and all that. I was pitching that more than the spiritual aspects of yeah, the voyage. Yeah, even though you knew well, that I was don't, there. I, yeah. I don't know of spiritual expeditions that have been funded before. Yeah, right. And I needed yeah. to think of a, more of a scientific thing to reach out to. Uh, and at uh, that time, the first President Bush called to go to Mars. And I no. thought, wow, the timing is just yeah, great. Right, People right. are going to be interested. Another But you know, no one ever yeah. believed that I could do what I was going to do. Nobody, could no say, nobody can go. They, everybody, even the Mariners, said it can't be done. Or something. Everyone said days. it can't be done. No one believed it was possible. Even no the people one had ever conceived that sort even of Even the thing. ones who had gone for long distances themselves and experienced it would say that can't be done. I mean, the ones who well, were experienced in that, not just off the top of their so head. So few people are experienced in that. Yeah, I know. It would be very small. There's no one experienced in it, hardly right. at all. Yeah, There's right. only like one or two men. Right, that's pretty small. That, that went ahead of me that are experienced that's in it. That's a pretty small That are team. here in the world. Uh, Robin Knox Johnson and, and John Sanders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and I did communicate with John Sanders. And also, there's an you interesting were story you about were, him. Okay, go ahead if you want to tell. That jumps to the future, though. We're working our way there. Well, I was just going to ask one little thing, because you said something about the crew, if they go to Mars and all of that. But the thing you were doing, if I may, because you sailed, you sailed with Sonia out here on uh, J J April 21 of 2007. We saw you all and everything like that and then she came back after 305 days or so and everything but then you sailed on for 1125 days and came up just a couple of weeks ago or a couple a month or so ago here to New York but you were out there singular you were on your own for over two uh, years she was there as your mate for a, a shipmate you know helped to do get things done before she had to leave and then you had to do it you were on your own it wasn't a team effort and what you were doing was a very singular thing it that's was a, a singular, difference. a singular venture because that's a, that's hundreds of days by yourself on the great oceans of the world, no connection, no resupply except a little iridium telephone connection back for a little bit of communication and so forth. So it was a singular thing, and your heroic effort was a very singular thing. It wasn't a group thing. You know what I mean? You were talking about a group going to Mars, well, or the group right. dynamics. I, in I hope that I could ex uh, but I'm wondering explore if they're ready the group dynamics. I wonder dynamics, if we're still able to celebrate singular activity in a world where everything has to be done by groups or bureaucracies or something like that. You know, it's got to involve a lot of people, and we don't celebrate the singular hero, to use that term. Where have all the heroes and heroines gone? It's just an, an offshoot uh, thought that I had myself. You're, you were doing something in a very singular, individualized way. Well, as over the years, yeah. as I was preparing to go, my original concept was to take uh, six people, because I took eight to Antarctica. And sailing a big gaff rig schooner like this, there were times when it was I was sure happy we had eight people on the boat pulling ropes and doing all the stuff that we did. You and had to have all of them to do all that stuff. How the hell did you do everything like that where you were on the sea for hundreds and hundreds of days all by yourself when it took eight people to do it? Is it different in Antarctica or on the was, great it ocean? Was, it was a learning process okay. to where I learned how to do it by myself. All right. Uh, because my original Self -reliance. concept... Self-reliance. Mm -hmm. Self-reliance. Mr. Emerson. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, go Sure. Ahead. An American value, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the frontier. I was going to take six, yeah. six yeah. people on the thousand-day sea voyage. Mm -hmm. But over the years, I never could find anyone that wanted, wanted to go. Wanted to go. I would think so. And I thought that people <laughs> would want to go and do that right. sort of thing, but no one wanted to go. <laughs> Wonderful. So, yeah. uh, and, and... What are you, uh, crazy? Yeah. Yeah, I could yeah. never find right. all the all the press I got and, mm -hmm. and all of the sailors I knew. No one wanted to go. Oh, that's the way it so, is. You know, uh, Babe Ruth Well, I certainly believe that... Uh, uh, that a woman would want to go with me yeah. if we fell in love. Yeah, because you wonderful. know women will wonderful? go where the men go. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, if it's, and if, I think that if the vibe is there, yeah, right. Well, yes, and but the you know, men, yeah. women came with uh, the brave 
people who came to America Absolutely. in the beginning, yeah, and they been. had no way of writing back to their family. Yeah, Those women had to be very huge. brave to go into the unknown. Absolutely. And I, and I figured, well, if I could find a woman to go with me, mm -hmm. if anything happened and she had to get off, mm -hmm. uh, um, could. we could have her rescued. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't, mm -hmm. uh, she wouldn't have to be taking uh, as much of a chance as the mm -hmm. women who came to America when America was discovered. Right, right. right so right. Uh, so I, as I tried to get crew, I realized it would only be myself and a woman. Mm -hmm. So I started to uh, that could to be your learn, first mate. I like, started yeah. to learn how to sail the boat with less and less people, and I started to make some changes. Had to you the done boat sailing all by yourself that. before? Or with only I sailed you the on catamaran the for a while. Not by the myself. catamaran, the Anne. Were you were no. you able? Because that's a big. It's a lot you have no. to repair sails. You have to do rigging. You have to do all kinds of things. It's a lot of work keeping that thing it's going. It's a big boat, and, and you're it's on a, a lot boat of work and, sailing it. And you got you're in a big boat in the middle of the ocean, and that's you know. Oh, what a fantastic thing it is! It is when the wind hits. Yeah. all the sails are full, and the <laughs> yeah. boat's leaning over and bounding through the waves. Yeah, and right. you're there riding. It's it's a fantastic is thing. It fair it's a great say, experience. Is it? We want to get back to that fellow you were mentioning, but uh, is it fair to say it's like a biosphere? You got no resupply. Like they had the biosphere down in Texas where they go inside a dome yeah. and then they live just without being contact from outside. Mm -hmm. It's like a biosphere because you were just living off the resources of the ocean by and large. You took some with you. Right. But is it similar to the concept of a biosphere? Well, I, I met some of those people. They were mm -hmm. also promoting what they were doing yeah. as a thing that would relate to space and yeah. man going right. into space. So I yeah. met some of those people at some of the space conferences that I spoke at. Mm -hmm. So there are similarities. We both wound up promoting what we were doing as yeah. a learning experience for man as he would evolve off of this earth and go into outer and space. And you were thinking future, too. You were thinking future. That's well, a future thing. Well, I live in, in the future, yeah. and I live in the past, and I merged them together. Nietzsche said, the future influences or, cr or creates the present as much as the past. So you're thinking in the future. The future we should be thinking and orienting our design of institutions and everything with a firm connection to the future as much as we are rooted in the past, there's a tendency for people to reify outdated institutions and so forth. But that's the side. We should all look, uh, look to look the future to the, and expand our thinking look into to a long-term value. the values. silver lining that comes in future's view, my friend, or something like that. But anyway, yeah. you were talking about somebody that you were wanting to uh, illuminate his life or somebody that you were in touch with. And then I got off on a sidebar. There was somebody that you had been in touch with and you were going to talk to or about? Somebody that had been in your life? Well, I might have uh, uh, It was mentioned. the person you mentioned a name. Well, okay, I'll tell you. John Sanders. That's it. John Sanders uh, held the two longest sea voyages in the record, mm. uh, on record for many, many years. Mm. And we had communicated uh, <coughs> because he knew that I was going to set out to go a thousand days. Yeah. And uh, so... Now, Sonia, my girlfriend, yes, right. who is with me now, uh -huh, uh, yeah. with our two-year-old son. Wonderful lady. Yeah, wonderful. And she's Darcy. been on your show maybe twice before. Yeah, two or three times. She's well, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, uh, she set out with me, and she did 305 days at sea. That's right. I remember, yeah. She got sick. Yeah. And, uh, Coming and around it was very Cape Horn, worrisome for it? me. Around well, Cape we were in the Southern Ocean, uh, but uh, in the South Indian Ocean, yeah, right. I mean, between Antarctica and South Africa, we were in the furthest place in the world. Yeah, right. And she was uh, getting sick. We didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was very worrisome mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. And we said, what can we do? And she was sick and sick and sick, and we realized she had to get off the boat. Yeah. When she left with me, uh -huh. she said, well, what, what happens if something happens and I have to get off the boat? Mm -hmm. And I said, if you have to get off the boat... I'll get you off the boat, but, but I, I have to keep going. That's right. I and that's have. what I told everyone. Who yeah, I right. said, do you yeah. want to come with yeah, me? And right. they said, well, what if we can't do it? Mm -hmm. I'll let you off the boat. That's but right. But I have to keep you going. Had, you had a lodestar. I had to you do had it. You had a lodestar. You yeah. had a dream. You so had a vision. So Sonia knew yeah. that I had to go on. Right. Uh -huh. And she was sick. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, who can rescue her? And I've said, well, Australia's up ahead. We'll contact John Sanders, who holds the longest sea ah, record in was, voyage. Was he, he there? Would understand. He was Australian, right? He would understand. Yeah, absolutely. And he would be the one to come out and rescue Camaraderie us. between yeah. uh, Well, so he was very magnanimous yeah. to yeah. come out and save her and allow me to go on and beat his So records. you didn't go ashore at all. You, they came out to the boat, and they took her off, right. uh, off at Perth, I think, right? Yeah, and brought Perth. her back here. And we found out that, you yeah. know, why she was feeling ill. And, and so. well, we found out that... That she was pregnant, we yeah, weren't sure. Right. Uh -huh. right, right. So, um, so she has the longest record 
for, for uh, any woman sailing at sea. days? The yeah. Good for her. But of course her. she sailed longer than any she's American a very, man ever she's, has. She was a very stalwart shipmate, wasn't she? She really well, you know, did her she, work. She's, she's um, a very petite lady. Yes, yeah, she's small. But she's but she, very, uh, um, very... Hard working? She's very uh, spiritually strong. And mm -hmm. she always was stable and gave me strength and courage. Mm-hmm when I needed it. It must have been she never, really... She never uh, made me worry that she was unstable uh -huh. and she never uh, freaked out and is, she kept me stable and gave me strength. This is another... And that makes a great sailor and a great crew member and a great partner in this life. This is the scene in the movie that's going to be your life and so forth like a feature film because there's going to have to be close-up shots of the parting of when they leave. Goodbye, and they're gonna. You know what I mean? It's gonna be. It must have been a very disquieting moment when you had to have her leave. So John Sanders came, came and got her. Yeah, but I'm talking about you now, my friend. You must now, have been very sorry to see her go because now you were gonna sail on by yourself out into well, the ocean. The it tough, must have been a tough the toughest moment. Part of the voyage. We got to get close-ups of your face and things at yeah. the moment when you do that. With lots of emotion and everything. You know what? I'm yeah. making a joke. Yeah. But that that's happened, true. and she set a record in her own right for a yeah. woman, and that's a real considerable well, thing. And, and she sailed longer at sea than any American man ever has. Uh, There's true. only a few men in the world that have sailed longer than that. That's an amazing thing. All, all the ladies' magazines could pick up on that. Well, another she should heroine. be a great inspiration. She should be a heroine. You're a hero. She should be a heroine of the American culture more than they are. We want to get it to why. It was a very brave thing that she did. It was. And it took a lot of uh, strength to be able to do it and do it well. Yeah, and she brought you Darcy. The son. You got a two-year-old son that you met as you came off the boat. Son. And is he any good at all? Is he a good? Is he He's got a anything great guy. good? Yeah, I'm making oh, yeah. a joke. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I know. I've seen Darcy. I saw him dance with those lady, the Isidore Duncan dancers over at the pier there. You know, it was yeah. really funny. He went out onto the dance floor and danced with the modern dancers at but our it, return party. It was a, what was it? June or July 17th? J June 17th. June right? 17th. June 17th. You came sailing up to Hudson and you landed almost right on the money. It was 1 p.m. You came sailing up to 42nd Street and Broadway after setting, or, or the river, after setting 1,152 days at sea. Yeah. Congratulations, my <laughs> brother. Now, my thought on all of that is that at that moment, you you are, I mean, you, you're very modest and everything like that, but, you know, you are, in the true sense of the word, what is called an American hero. That was a heroic venture. You set a world pattern thing, uh, both in athletic terms, the athleticness of it. You had to be in perfectly good shape. It's a tremendous uh, feat to, fill off, to pull off successfully. Uh, and that sort of thing. I guess the, some things broke down at the end. They, they, oh. The end looked a little weather-worn, you know, when That's she fine. came up the Hudson, but she deserved it and everything. Yeah. She just came sailing right up. Now, what I want to know is, in your thought, you talked before about getting the big media and the big shots and all that kind of stuff behind you. you got some of the best people in your corner from the cyber world and the artistic world. Carter Emmer was following you from the Rose Planetarium and other things like that. But you weren't able to get the major support that you might have liked to have had, and so that made you were pulling it off in an individualized, self-reliant, Emerson kind of way, mm -hmm. and you pulled it off, which has a great heroic quality to it and everything like that. What I want to know is why wasn't the President of the United States and at least the mayor and the governor of New York and everybody else there to greet you as you came sailing up to the, you had very good people that were there, but why weren't you given a hero's welcome Similar to what was accorded Lindbergh when he sailed across the Atl or flew across the Atlantic Ocean was another American hero greeted by the president and given a ticker tape parade. What's your thought on that? Why there hasn't been greater recognition of the historic, meaningful uh, event that is the celebration of your, your life in that experience, do you think? Well, the, uh, I mean, it may be, it's in the future. It's to happen. It's going to be understood. But what I'm saying is why... It's going to be What's understood. going on with the ad people and the media people not to recognize what a story, what a incredible historic, heroic story, in an age that needs heroic uh, metaphors or, or examples. What do you think? Well, there, there's a lot of things to be said about that. The, the French and European interviewers that interviewed me, well, mm -hmm. they said, if you were French, you'd have a ticker tape parade, you'd be a national hero. Thank you. And yeah, they told me that, but, but, What do you call it? Fireworks going off and everything like that, you know. Well, yeah. uh, what is this country so lame? 
um, I don't know exactly what it was, but I always had the impression that no one ever understood me what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Because when I was promoting the voyage for years, no one believed that I could do it. No one had ever conceived of such a thing. Yeah. So when Lindbergh did what he did, or when Sir Edmund Hillary was the first to Mount Everest, mm. there were a lot of men who were close behind him, who all had that idea. Mm -hmm. And no oh, one had the idea of what I was doing. No uh -huh. one thought about it. There's no one who's even close behind me to come along after me and do that. So right. it was a, such a singular act. Right. It didn't singular, fit yeah. into the mechanism of promotion of the for uh, uh, the mechanism of our media, of our society, of the way everything is working. Uh -huh. And if I had been a, a, an, a, an actor or a tennis player or something everyone could understand, mm -hmm. then I would have been celebrated. But people really don't understand very well what I've done. No sailor has approached me. Mm -hmm. when I was preparing or since I've been back it has given me a, any clue that anyone in the sailing world understands what I did. Did uh, they look at the boat and say, well, how did you do this? How is it possible? Mm -hmm. No one looked to this, see. So I say they don't understand. Right. Now, okay, that's the beginning. That's about, always the beginning with the visionary. And the psychology of A visionary, it. nobody understands. I was they, talking about yeah. it the technical yeah. sailing aspects. Right, 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 right. With so your no mariner one, buddies. No, one yeah. no yeah. one's looking at the technical aspects of it's how a huge I did what story I did. in that, yeah. Well, and then there's the psychology of it. Mm -hmm. The psychology of doing something like that, living in a life and death condition for a long period of time. Quite literally. And what happens to yeah. you yeah. and so forth. Boat almost went over a couple of times. It did, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's the whole spiritual aspect because in order to do something like that, you're taken into a realm that's incomprehensible to a logical mind. So you right. might have very brilliant people who understand things that can be deduced rationally, yeah. but as soon as or you go into a realm that's right, right. not uh, measurable and calculatable, a realm that's, uh, uh, that's almost indescribable, then you can't understand that, what, that so well unless you're familiar with existing in, in right. uh, in a, in a state of mind that's of a higher consciousness. Yeah, uh, a higher kind or thinking. So maybe, I think that the yeah. heroes of, of, of America right now yeah. are, are as high as the media can depict them in movie stars, well, actors, what are they? and the sports movie stars, stars are all... But there's something beyond that. I would but think But the people so. can't see beyond that to, to other things. Yeah, there's what they call celebrity or something. And what you have to do, you have to get drunk or do all kinds of crazy things and, 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 and get into rehab and all that. Then that gets in the news for some reason and they celebrate that or somebody can sing a song or something. Uh, I don't know why they celebrate that sort of thing and not celebrate an heroic thing like what you're doing. I can't understand it. Um, and you, you said, everybody said it couldn't be done. That's what they said about everybody who did anything, uh, in a sense. Remember, it used to be, well, if man was meant to fly, would have, God would have, or whatever, would have given us wings. You know, there were people who, when they kitty hawk, mm -hmm. and they thought, you're going to fly, you're, they'd laugh. They would do that. They would laugh. They would laugh at anything new like that because they're thinking... Uh, retrogressively rather than future. You know, we said that thing about Nietzsche's thing about the future influences or creates the present as much as the past, which is a little hard for people to see. But you were, and that's in the future, but then also you were, you, unlike Lindy, uh, I talked this with Carter, uh, and Lindy was flying into the world across the Atlantic with the thing, and he set the world, and he was a hero of the whole world. Just the whole world exploded, and he was presaging a growth of a great big industry, the, the aeronautical industry, where people were going to be able to make a lot of money. Understand? So that it's what, that's, the world is so practically minded, maybe because they don't have a right economic order. We're having all kinds of trouble with the economy now, so everybody's insecure. So the only thing that people are interested in is the practical thing. How do I make money? That's the only thing. And if something has to be something that they're going to be see a lot of people make a lot of money. And it's hard to see, with your case, how are you going to make a lot of money from sailing a 19th uh, century boat in an eight, do you understand what I'm saying? Can you see that maybe that's why they don't do it because they can't see there's a buck in it? Well, or a mass marketing thing that's going to make some money for a whole lot of people? Or what do you think? Well, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's not a material thing as it is a spiritual thing. Yeah, right. And spiritual? that's the real, the real message of the voyage right. uh, um, is a spiritual message. And, and a we message don't celebrate of love. those values. The society doesn't celebrate those values nearly as much as they should. 
and need examples to allow them to, to be something concerned with the practical question of how are we going to get bread to eat and everything. You know well, what I'm I saying? Like to, uh, it, it, because they don't, they, don't, they don't have a system in place that's going to be liberating of the human spirit that the future requires. They're just reifying outdated institutions and thought patterns of human nature and everything. But they have always celebrated the hero. And we are in need of heroes, and we need you as a hero. America we Online. need to let the world know about you because we need you as a hero. You can't, uh, you can't, uh, you know, uh, not assume that mantle, if I may say so. And I'm very happy to hear you've been in touch with David Fisher, and there's a book now being put together. Uh, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that in a future tense, because your story is going to become one. And not, not. And, and what, uh, what about the ladies? I mean, Sonia should become a heroine. We need heroes and heroines rather than just people who can go into detox or something being our celebrities. If you understand what I'm saying, oh, the sure. spiritual questions are really important and you embody them. Don't you think? Sure. Good. Well, I'm glad Ameri you got that I'll, good I'll view tell you of yourself. America Online mm. titled their, their story, New York City Sailor Credits Love for History Making Sea Voyage. Mm -hmm. So we were able to use the media <laughs> to spread the message of love to the world. Okay, good, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, like and John Lennon instead, and of, Yoko, a, instead yeah. of all negative facts yeah. in the news, yeah. here's a positive, uh, and what in the world does that mean? Yes, and right. And it talks about love. So, <laughs> yeah, right. So th therefore, we were able to spread the message of love through the mainstream media. And to me, that was a much greater satisfaction than breaking any records. Okay, I understand what you're saying because you've got that spiritual quality. You're mm -hmm. tuned into higher values than the mundane practical, if I may say right. so, which is on the minds of so many people and so forth. And it is true. Is it worth mentioning that they are now seriously getting down to putting your life story into a book form that could begin to be celebrating your life's experience and your adventure and your, your spiritual artistic contributions and so forth? And is, could we mention that? Well, right now, it's in I, this formative I have a co-author, David Fisher, who's a successful writer, had many bestsellers. More than success, a lot of mightily books. successful. And mm -hmm. he writes beautifully. I read some of his stuff. He's a great writer. He really is. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're trying to do a mainstream story that'll be interesting to as many people as possible. I would ask my audience. That will share this voyage. I would ask my, I, I, and are you going to have some, to, if I may, and I, I know it's just forming and everything. I'm glad it is because it should be done in the hands of people who can really get it out there, as they say, into the world. Uh, but uh, where you would have photographs and sort of things that could uh, enhance the book. I don't know what the pattern or the design and everything is, but uh, that's something that would be really good, including uh, some sort of a... Well, I don't know. I, have you got options out yet from Spielberg for the movie? There's a movie, do you, you understand, because the old world's going that way, so that they could make a, a mighty classical American movie uh, of your life's experience with you as a... Well, I hope You could that be the star, or would we have to have somebody else as a star? But you're very close to the age when you did this, so maybe we'd have to have somebody who play you as a youth when you're maybe doing the catamaran. You have to get the casting right and all that. But do you understand what I'm saying? And that it would begin to be really recognized on a large... Uh, blockbuster kind of way in terms of world consciousness to help spread the spiritual values that are really motivating. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, and and those to me are the most exciting things. Okay. Those are those are real things that make life real exciting. Yeah. To to be able to follow your dreams in into a realm that that encompasses mythology. And all of man's uh, quests for the unknown. The purpose in the universe, all yeah. the big issues. Yeah, all those right, things. absolutely. Those, that's way we more need exciting that desperately, than, brother. We need that because we don't yeah. have that. It's so mundane, the consciousness and everything, that, you know, in terms of the, the, the enormous challenge that's before us now as a human society and its consciousness in this universe. So I think, and you're, you've started that, I, that process. I'm so happy you're, uh, you're home. Uh, you, do you still do you think of New York as home? Do you think North yes, Carolina? Yes. No. Well, North Carolina is my original home, and it's still a home to me. Well, you got a wonderful though. Family I grew there. up traveling. Yeah. Right. So I don't really have a, a hometown. 
Can New York claim you? I want yes, to claim you as a New Yorker. I've been living in New York. Okay. There's no other city I'd want to live in. All right, all right. We, okay. He's a New, New York. Yorker. Yeah. Well, I, I can't imagine another city I'd want to live in. can't imagine another city. I'm from Detroit, and I'd rather live in New York. Yeah. And New York's a great town and everything like yeah. that. And, it, and it's coming along well uh, in terms of that. Do you sort of relish the idea of having this story, your life story put into uh, media where it gets really serious attention and so forth. And well, I think it would be does Mr. inspiring. Fisher, does Mr. Fisher and his agents and representatives have experience with optioning uh, works that they have to the film industry? And are you yes. thinking about that? We hope it happens. Yeah. Yeah, we're working on it. I'd like to take a survey of the viewing audience. I would think that this is a classic example of somebody who could be the stuff of a gigantic blockbuster cinemagraphic movie that, it, that 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 would just uh, well they they would they would break all the records on, on whenever the film industry puts out a movie about a great adventure or something like the African Queen or something you know like that because it's an exciting inherently exciting and interesting story and um, so you're settling in congratulations on having completed that we can only talk briefly we only got an hour we're coming near toward the end now we've got about three or four minutes left. Anything else you might want to get in here before we have to say goodbye to the audience? Uh, any well, points you want to get across? And I talk too much. But I'm glad that, that you like it so much. I and do. that you think I it do. should be an American story. And in a sense, it, it is. It's about love. It's about family love. Mm -hmm. It's about the love that my family gave me so that I looked out into the that world. That was important, yeah. Mm -hmm. When I dis was discovering who I was, I looked out into the world with with love and with the strength of love believing that I could do anything that I wanted to do and that I would be helped and that I could follow my dreams and I was given an incredible work ethic mm -hmm. you have to work real hard I knew that from the very beginning it was beginning. a work of love it's, it's like love a painter work. at his yeah. at his oh, canvas you he's not work love. You're, yeah. wor you're working, but it's a work of, it's a completely different, and it's self-motivated. And those people who helped me came and yeah. helped out of love. So. And so it's a, it's a, it's a low-budget family and friends, mm -hmm. grassroots effort to uh, accomplish something that, that uh, no man thought was possible. And it was made possible by a group of uh, friends and, and family and people who contributed to help make it possible. It's an all-American story. It's an all-American, world-class story that ought to be told. I wonder who we're going to cast for you as a 10-year-old, how we're going to get the casting done for that, and then for a 19-year-old, somebody that's got a great deal of energy that runs to the ocean first before anybody else, yeah. as you said when I talked uh -huh. to you before. Sure. But it's an exciting story, and I congratulate you, both you and uh, Sonia, and Darson, is he Darshan? Darshan. Is that got a little literal name or literal uh, literal meaning? Darshan. Well, it it does mean to uh, to see the light or to see, see God or to go before uh, God. Well, that's okay, and it's so wonderful. He's about two years old now. Wonderful. Yes. Congratulations mm -hmm. to both of you on that wonderful event, and congratulations on the work. It's really magnificent. So good to talk to you, Reed. Thank you. And it's your pleasure to have the perceptions, I'm going to say it again, of a genuine American hero destined to be recognized as such by the American and World Society. Happy to have been able to help get some of that down here and share it with the wider audience. And all the very best to you, Reed, and thanks a lot for such a very, 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 very well-led life that continues. Okay. Okay, we'll be coming back again tomorrow, so tune in then, please. And uh, once again, so good to see you. And give my very best to Sonia and, and Darshan. Darshan and Carter. Carter also is a great friend in your corner and others. Slatkus yeah. and all the rest of the gang. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, so anyway, it's really, uh, we got some of that stuff in and everything like that. And it's still good to talk to you. I think to just run in the credits. Now.